I'd like to start by apologizing because I have a neighbor who plays bagpipes and he decided that today is a good day to be extra loud. So I'm sorry if you can hear him in the background. I'll do my best to cover it up in post. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. We are doing another book versus movie comparison today. In case you don't know, I recently read the Lord of the Rings trilogy for the first time. I have loved these movies since I was 12 years old and saw Fellowship of the Ring for the first time in theaters. I have seen them more times than I could possibly count. So it was really interesting for me to finally read the books. Just to be clear, I won't be listing every single detail that was changed compared to the books because then we'll be sitting here for a long, long time. And many of the changes are quite uninteresting, just specific events taking place in other locations or certain lines that are given to other characters, things like that. I will just be focusing on uh, the bigger changes as well as some smaller ones that I personally thought were significant. So yeah, if you are unfamiliar with how things go in the books or just would like to freshen up your memory, I do have videos where I go in fairly good detail through all three of the books and uh, I'll link those for you in the description. So, without further ado, let's get into it. I think Fellowship is the one where you will find the most differences and it all starts in the beginning. In the book, the actual plot takes many years to start. We begin when Frodo turns 33 and Bilbo turns 111. That is when Bilbo leaves the Shire and Frodo takes over possession of the ring. But he doesn't actually leave the Shire until after his 50th birthday. So the hobbits, with the exception of Bilbo, have been significantly aged down for the movies. And let's not forget one very important hobbit that we do not in fact see in the movie. And that is Farmer Maggot. In the movie, we get a brief line from him as he's chasing the hobbits through the cornfield before they fall down the hill, but that's pretty much it. But in the book, Farmer Maggot is delightful. He invites the hobbits to dinner, he tells off the Nazgul that's chasing them, and then he drives them to the river so they can get safely to Buckland. He's just great. <laughs> So Buckland and the Old Forest is another thing that was entirely removed in the movies. Frodo had actually purchased a house in Buckland as a diversion of sorts and he had a servant there named Fredegar Bulger. Bul Bulger. <laughs> Although they called him Fatty Bulger because he was overweight. And then we have Tom Bombadil, a colourful old man who lives in the old forest and who saves the hobbits from multiple sticky situations involving an angry old willow tree and some creepy whites who kidnap them down to their tombs. And I cannot stress this enough, he tells the hobbits to roll around naked in the grass as he goes to search for their ponies. And they do it. So then we get to Bree and the Inn of the Prancing Pony where we get a memorable scene of Frodo accidentally putting on the ring for the first time and thereby going invisible in a room full of people. In the book it is also by accident but it's not the first time he's wearing it and the cause is a little different. Frodo had had a few beers and was dancing on the table eventually falling off the table and slipping the ring onto his finger in the process. So he was drunk, in, in other words. The hobbits then team up with Aragorn, something that 
involved the innkeeper Barleyman Butterbur a lot more in the books than it did in the movies. And off they go. After a few days we get to Weathertop and they changed it in the movie so that the Nazgul's find them because Mary, Pippin and Sam were cooking and they, they saw them through their fire. That was not the case in the book. I, I got the feeling that the Nazgul's just managed to track them there on their own. So Frodo is stabbed here as we know and they hurry towards Trollshaws which is the land where Rivendell is. And I believe it is only in the extended edition that we see a glimpse of Bilbo's trolls from The Hobbit. <laughs> I actually didn't include these in my synopsis of Book Fellowship because I simply couldn't manage saying three stone trolls. At one point they reach a glade with three stone trolls. <laughs> At one point they reach a glade with three trolls. I cannot say three stone trolls. Trolls. <laughs> anyway, then we get to a fairly big change. Glorfindel in the book is replaced by Arwen and it is she that flees with Frodo from the Nazgul's and is the one to summon the flood at the ford. In the book, I believe it is Elrond who summons the Flood remotely from Rivendell, but that is nowhere near as awesome as having Arwen do it, so I am 100% on board with this change. The movies have a lot more of Arwen in general, which I love. If you've seen my Return of the King video, you'll know that I was a bit disappointed by the lack of Arwen in the main story. And there is actually a section in the appendices that tells the love story of Aragorn and Arwen, which people were very quick to point out to me. <laughs> and this was kind of used when expanding their relationship in the movies. I say kind of because it's really only the odd word here and there. I do, however, appreciate the movie's aim to incorporate more Aragorn and Arwen into the story. So, the Council of Elrond is hugely condensed in the movie. In the book, it literally goes on for, I don't know, 50 pages, something? A, a long, long time! The whole Rivendell section is a lot longer in the book in general, but there aren't really any important plot points that happen here apart from the Fellowship being formed and Bilbo giving Frodo the Mithril shirt as well as the Sword Sting. About the Fellowship, I was surprised to find that in the book both Aragorn and Boromir aren't actually official fellowship members from the start. Their plan was to just tag along for a portion of the journey and then they would leave for Minas Tirith together as the fellowship reached Gondor. This ties into a significant difference between Book Aragorn and Movie Aragorn. <laughs> Movie Aragorn is an exile by choice. He is reluctant to pursue his rightful place as king. Book Aragorn, however, is quite thirsty for the throne. <laughs> he really, really wants to claim his title. The only, re the only reason why he hadn't claimed it yet was because he had been held back by Elrond until he had proven himself worthy, kind of. While I sometimes feel like Book Aragorn is a bit too pompous for my liking, he does display a confidence that movie Aragorn doesn't. As for Boromir, his personality is kind of lacking in the book. He's basically just the stereotype brave soldier. As the Fellowship tried to take the Pass of Karadras, the movie adds a bit of foreshadowing that Boromir is feeling tempted by the ring, but that does not happen in the book. 
After they leave the Pass of Caradhras and go towards Moria, there are a few additional scenes here in the book that were skipped in the movie. First, it takes a good while for them to decide on whether or not to go through Moria, and second, as the Fellowship make camp on a hill, they are attacked by wolves and wargs, and Gandalf fights them off with magical fire. And then we get to the Watcher in the Water, the giant tentacled creature in the lake outside the Gate of Moria. In the movie, it is Merry and Pippin who throw stones in the water, but in the book, it's actually Boromir who's feeling a little bit impatient. And then Frodo is dragged towards the water by the tentacles, and in the movie, the whole fellowship comes together to rescue him, but in the book, it is literally only Sam who runs to help him, and the rest just kind of watch. I think the movie did so well in capturing the eeriness of Moria. That whole chapter in the book is really best described with that word, eerie. <laughs> to be honest, I was slightly confused by the fight scene at the end in the book because it doesn't quite happen the same way in the movie. Instead of everyone fighting together and running together, Gandalf kind of stays behind as the others run ahead and seals the door with a spell, but this ends up draining his energy so much that they have to continue for about an hour or so in complete darkness, as Gandalf can't even muster enough magic to light his staff for them. So that kind of takes the wind out of the sails a little bit, and I prefer the movie version where the quiet moments are all in the start of Moria, and then it's action all the way up until the Balrog arrives. And I'm sorry to say it, but You Shall Not Pass is really not the same in the book. I mean, I'm not sure what I was expecting, since this scene is one of the most epic moments in cinema history. It's no wonder that it feels a little bit anticlimactic in the book. So after Gandalf's fall, the Fellowship arrive in Lothlorien, where they're taken to Lady Galadriel and Lord Celeborn. This isn't as straightforward in the book, as they have to spend the night in the forest first, at the hideout of the elf Haldir. And this is also where the reader finds out that Gollum is following them. Once they are in the city of Carath Galathon, the main difference that I've noticed is that Sam is actually also invited to look into the mirror of Galadriel. This is just one out of many instances in the movies that where Sam is kind of pushed to the side to the benefit of Frodo. And I understand why they made this decision, but that doesn't mean I agree with it. And to make matters worse, when the Fellowship leaves Lothlorien, <laughs> the movie skips one of Sam's special gifts. Sure, he gets some nice rope, but Galadriel also gives him a little wooden box of unknown contents. And it's only in Return of the King, when they are back in the Shire, that he opens it and finds a seed from a melon tree, which is the uh, giant tree kind that the people of Lothlorien live in, and he plants it in the Shire. Just a bit of a side tangent. Let's move on. Things move along quite the same way as the Fellowship travel down the river, with the exception that Gollum tries to sneak up on them in the night yet again. Book Gollum is simply not as stealthy as movie Gollum. <laughs> the movie then goes on to show us Frodo going off on his own, as if he's literally stupid, <laughs> and not even telling anyone about it. I mean, Orcs are chasing them, Gollum is following him, but he really just needed that walk on his own. 
in the book he does tell people where he's going and that he just needs a moment to think as Aragorn has asked him to decide on their next route should they continue east or west down the river. You see, in the book it kind of makes sense why Boromir would follow Frodo to try and convince him to come to Minas Tirith with him. They are already at a crossroads and Frodo is the ring bearer and the ring bearer decides where they go. <laughs> I personally feel like Boromir's fall to temptation is a bit more logical in this particular scene but I do feel like the movie did a much better job in foreshadowing this from the start. As we know, the orcs catch up to them and we have an epic showdown where Boromir redeems himself as he tries to save Merry and Pippin and Aragorn gets a hero moment as well as he's fighting the Urukai. Although, none of this is in the book, at least not in Fellowship. The book ends just like the movie with Frodo trying to leave the others behind but Sam refused to leave him, so they go off towards Mordor on their own. So the ending of Fellowship and beginning of Two Towers is a little bit blurred when you compare it to the movies. In Fellowship, the movie, we see how Boromir dies trying to defend Merry and Pippin from being taken by the orcs, um, but in the book, this is only told to us in retrospect. In the book, we see how Aragorn finds Boromir during his last breaths, and Boromir tells him that he tried to take the ring from Frodo, and his last words before dying were that he had failed, which is quite depressing. <laughs> I like the change they made for the movie where they had Boromir accept Aragorn as his king and they had a brotherly sort of moment before he died. That was a bit more endearing in my view. So Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli prepare a funeral ritual for Boromir before going off to track the orc company that had kidnapped Merry and Pippin. The POV then switches over to Merry and Pippin as they travel with the orcs and these sections are a lot more extensive in the book. We even get to see the build-up to the confrontation with Eomer and his company of riders and we get to see that from the orcs perspective. I thought that was so interesting and it's a bit of a shame that it's not in the movie. But Merry and Pippin escaping into Fangorn Forest is fairly similar between book and movie, although things divert quite heavily as soon as they team up with Treebeard. The movie has enhanced the importance of the hobbits coming to Fangorn and even gave them the credit of convincing the Ents to go to war. In the book, however, Treebeard is just babysitting them while he is planning to take action against Saruman. Most of the time it's not even him keeping an eye on them, he just puts them on another end called Quickbeam while he's busy. So Aragorn and company eventually run into Eomer and his riders and movie Aragorn introduces them to Eomer humbly while book Aragorn makes a big deal of him being the heir to the throne of Gondor. Overall, Aragorn is delightfully self-important in the book and I find it very amusing. But anyway, Book Elmer then goes on to lend them to horses under the condition that they return them to Edoras once they are finished with their search. Movie Elmer just gives them away. So they track Merry and Pippin into Fangorn where they meet the new shiny Gandalf. Practically the same in book and movie, and together they ride for Edoras. Once in Edoras, they go to see Theoden, King of Rohan. We also meet Lady Eowyn for the first time, and Gandalf does his magic to cure the king from Saruman's influence, and Grima Wormtongue is, for some reason, let go without consequences for his actions. Fairly similar in book and movie. One difference, however, is that Book Theoden had just put his nephew Eomer under house arrest in the city and not banished him like he did in the movie. 
though Eome was released and took part in the upcoming events from the start. So after Gandalf had explained the threat of Saruman, Book Theoden is ready to take up arms against Saruman's army in open war and immediately rallies his troops. Movie Theoden, though, just wants to take his people and flee to Helm's Deep as the number one priority. In the book, the Rohan army ride along with Gandalf and company, but it's only after a messenger warns them about the massive threat facing them that they were forced to change strategy. This is also when Gandalf runs off in a cryptic errand and telling the others that he'll be back in a few days. And then we get to Helm's Deep, one of the most epic battle sequences in cinema history. And it is quite epic in the book as well. The main difference would be that Book Helm's Deep have no elves joining the battle at the last minute, and when Gandalf comes in to save the day, he brings some random Lord of the Westfold that the reader doesn't know. It makes perfect sense for the movie to change this into Eomer, as we already know of him. Gandalf was also the one who brought the menacing trees, as he had ridden to Isengard and spoken with Treebeard to get their help. In the movies, the trees are just there. It's not explained that it was actually Gandalf who had brought them. I wasn't really sure where to put this, as the movies put this section in the beginning of Return of the King, but it's actually supposed to be at the end of Two Towers. Gandalf, Theoden, Aragorn and company ride for Isengard after their victory at Helm's Deep to confront Saruman. In the book, this is where they meet up with the Grey Company, Aragorn's group of rangers from the north, and they tag along with them as well. While at Isengard, Book Merry and Pippin tell their story to Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli over a picnic. But the biggest difference here is that in the movie, this is where Saruman dies. Book Saruman, however, is just confronted by Gandalf and loses his powers, and is then put under a guardianship of Treebeard before they proceed to clean up Isengard. Up until this point, the book was actually really quick paced. There was a lot of action and excitement in general. Then we move over to the Frodo and Sam section of the book, which is different. <laughs> this is the start of the slow, gritty experience that is Frodo's and Sam's journey to Mount Doom. And you can tell that Peter Jackson and the other writers of the movies found this a little bit difficult to adapt because they have added a lot of dramatic stuff that doesn't happen in the book. Frodo falling into the water in the Dead Marshes is added, uh, Sam sliding down the hill before the Black Gate is added, and even when they meet Faramir in Ithilien, they change it so that Faramir desires the ring and brings the hobbits all the way to Osgiliath before he actually lets them go. In the book, Faramir doesn't desire the ring at all and has just no problem letting them go. <laughs> he simply houses them in his ranger's hideout for a few days and gives them food and provisions and sends them on their way. But there is another difference uh, from the book that I actually like better in the movie, and that is when movie Frodo has to lure Gollum out of the Forbidden Pool in Athelion, only to have him be captured and mistreated by the rangers. Gollum feels betrayed by Frodo as he had started to trust him, and thus he decides that he will leave the lead the hobbits to Shelob to die. Book Gollum, however, had decided to take them to Shelob from the point where they had teamed up, basically, so the reader is aware of this plan from the start. And this makes Gollum warming up to Frodo a bit pointless, since it has no impact on the story. So the movie ends here with Frodo, Sam and Gollum on their way towards the Morgul Vale entrance to Mordor. 
but the book still has a decent amount left, meaning she loves Lair. And oh dear, <laughs> that is alright. So now we are comparing Book Two Towers with movie Return of the King, just to be clear. We get some more added drama where movie Frodo sends Sam away before entering Shelob's tunnel. Book Frodo, however, enters the tunnel holding Sam's hand. It couldn't be any more different. And when Shelob finds them there, they work together to find a way out. One is lighting the starlight that was given to them by Galadriel, and the other was slashing at the webs with Sting. I get why Peter Jackson and team wanted Frodo to enter the tunnel alone, as it seems a lot more scary to the audience. But I actually prefer the book version here. For some reason it is a lot more eerie following their careful steps in this complete and dense darkness as this stench and unknown threat was looming over them. Once they are out of the tunnel, Book Frodo is stabbed by Shelob pretty much immediately, and Sam is awesome enough to take on both Gollum and Shelob on his own. The movies really did Sam dirty, that's the honest truth. <laughs> then we get to the big final difference before moving on to The Return of the King. So, in both book and movie, Sam thinks that Frodo is dead when he is in fact only unconscious. And then he hears some orcs approaching. In the movie, he takes the ring and hides, but in the book he actually puts on the ring to become invisible as they pass him. Thus ends the book version of The Two Towers. So the line is a little bit blurry on where to start this comparison, because the movie and the book start in very different places. The movie starts off with a flashback to when Gollum first got hold of the ring, and this is actually taken from Book Fellowship, where Gandalf tells the backstory of Gollum. But the book Return of the King just starts with Gandalf and Pippin coming to Minas Tirith to prepare for the upcoming siege. This final battle outside of Minas Tirith is the meat and bones of this book, at, at least for the first half. It is the main conflict. All characters, apart from Frodo and Sam, surround this particular event, which makes sense for the climax. The movie is quite similar to the book in the build-up, although a lot more fast-paced than in the book. But there's also some clear differences. For instance, Lady Eowyn. Movie Eowyn goes on with the Rohan army to Helm's Deep in the Two Towers, but Book Eowyn is still back at Edoras, as the king gave her leadership in his absence. So after Helm's Deep and the confrontation with Saruman at Isengard, Book Aragorn goes back to Edoras on his way to the Paths of the Dead. This is where we get the most romantic tension between him and Eowyn, although it's pretty one-sided. Book Eowyn isn't subtle at all. She begs him to take her with him, but he refuses as her place is with her people. And on the morning of him leaving Edoras, she begs him again on her knees, dressed in armor for everyone to see. But he still refuses. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I might actually prefer the movie version here, where it's just a private exchange between them. At least that's a little bit less humiliating. <laughs> So after this very blatant rejection, Book Eowyn decides to go to battle and seek glory on her own. But she has to disguise herself as a man and go in secret. Because it takes several days for the Rohan army to actually get to Minas Tirith, she makes up the fake persona called Dernhelm uh, during this time. The movie is kind of fast-forwarding through all of this, which makes sense for time-saving purposes. 
So then we get to the whole army of the dead situation. Book Aragorn goes to the mountain, not only with Legolas and Gimli, but the rangers called the Grey Company also comes with them. And it's actually a really simple endeavor. They just walk through it. <laughs> no one in the dead army questions them, threatens them, or challenges them in any way. On the contrary, in fact, they immediately start to follow them all the way through to the other side of the mountain, where they stop to declare their intentions to fight for Aragorn, to fulfill the oath that they had once broken. And then off they go to the city of Pelargir, meaning not Minas Tirith, uh, where an epic battle takes place that the reader does not see. <laughs> and that's it. In the movie, it is a lot more dramatic than that. <laughs> Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli go there on their own. It is a very dangerous place and Aragorn has to grab the leader of the dead army by the throat to prove his claim. And then there's a flood of falling skulls that they have to get through. And then a moment of despair outside just before the leader emerges again, agreeing to join the fight. And then the army of the dead goes with them all the way to Minas Tirith and pretty much single-handedly turns the battle around in Gondor's favor. I'm not a huge fan of that as it makes Rohan seem kind of useless in this fight. In the book, Aragorn just brings more Gondorian soldiers using the enemy ships from Pelargir, which makes a lot more sense to me. So let's talk about what's going on inside the city of Minas Tirith during the battle. First off, Lord Denethor, steward of Gondor, is a bit sketchy in both versions, but for slightly different reasons, I would say. Book Denethor is of course devastated by his son Boromir's death, but he is also in possession of a Palantir, um, you know, one of those crystal balls, like the one that made such a ruckus in the two towers. Through his Palantir, Sauron had shown him visions of Gondor being defeated by Mordor, and this, along with Faramir being fatally wounded, kind of made him lose his mind. The movie has no mention of a Palantir, however, so it is assumed that his psychotic behavior, setting himself and his dying son on fire, was caused purely by grief. Also, he's quite erratic in the movie, <laughs> screaming to his soldiers to abandon their posts and flee for their lives, so Gandalf literally has to take command from him by force. In the book, he calmly hands over command to Gandalf as he doesn't want to leave Faramir's bedside. Anyway, back to the battlefield. Let's talk about the confrontation between Eowyn and the Nazgul King of Angmar, called the Witch King in the movie. I honestly think this was a lot better in the book as the exchange between them is a bit longer and, in my opinion, carries more meaning. Eowyn is immensely brave for challenging the Nazgul to defend her uncle and her being brave comes first, while her being a woman is second. In the movie, there's just something about I am no man. <laughs> That she feels so blatantly feminist, as if she's brave because she's a woman and not just brave and a woman. <laughs> you know, um, I might be reading too much into this, but that's just how I feel. <laughs> Let me know what you think in the comments. So the battle is won and Aragorn enters the city and goes to the Houses of Healing. Book Aragorn shows off his superior healing skills here, even managing to heal poor Faramir, whom we know is fatally wounded. This is because in the book there is a kind of prophecy or legend that tells that the true king has the hands of a healer. 
So everyone present can see firsthand that Aragorn really is who he says he is, pretty much. This, however, was cut from the film and we only see Aragorn having some basic healing knowledge throughout the, th the trilogy. Then both movie and book decide to take an army to the Black Gate of Mordor and challenge Saruman, no, Sauron, <laughs> um, as a diversion to give Frodo and Sam some more time. This endeavor, of course, uh, takes several days in the book and is a lot more fast-paced in the movie. So we get to the Black Gate and the mouth of Sauron comes out to negotiate and to show off Frodo's mythful shirt to indicate him being dead. In the book, Gandalf blinds him with his shiny white robes and they take the items from him, whereas in the movie, Aragorn cuts his head off. And so the Battle of the Black Gate has begun. Movie Aragorn gets his hero moment by fighting an armored troll, but in the book it's actually Pippin that kills a troll single-handedly. This is where the book uh, switches over to Frodo and Sam's POV, but the movie switches between them as the ring is destroyed so we can see the other characters' reactions to the eruption of Mount Doom. This is a heavy section of the book, but it is fairly quick in the movie. Sam rescues Frodo from the Tower of Kirith Ungol, where he was held captive, and Book Sam also has a moment where he is tempted to claim the ring for his own, but ultimately resists the temptation. This is removed in the movie and the viewer only sees that Sam has the ring when he reveals it to Frodo. Book Frodo is actually quite nasty to Sam here and he switches a lot between his normal self and his disagreeable self. He even calls Sam a thief, which really broke my heart. I just think Sam deserves so much better. But movie Frodo is a bit more mellow about the whole thing. So in the book, Frodo and Sam travel for several days through Mordor to get to Mount Doom, and Frodo either whines or sleeps the entire way. Both book and movie have them run into some marching orcs where they are for forced to join their ranks, but they start a fake fight so that they can flee unnoticed. And then we finally get to Mount Doom. <laughs> In the book, Frodo does indeed collapse and Sam has to carry him up the slope, but I think the movie did this so much better. I'm telling you, I cannot watch this scene without crying. I just... I love it so much. <laughs> and then we have Frodo standing at the edge, claiming the ring for his own. He does this both in book and movie, and Gollum attacks him as he is invisible and bites his finger off. So far it's the same, but book Frodo remains down and Gollum just topples over the edge as he's jumping from delight at having the ring back in his possession. In the movie, Frodo gets up to fight him one more time and they both go over the edge, but with Frodo hanging from the cliff for Sam to pull up. Then they are rescued by the eagles in both book and movie. Many people have complained about the number of endings in the movie Return of the King, but the book has about a hundred pages worth of endings, so you can see why this was a challenge. And I actually think they've done a great job condensing all of these endings in the movie, so let's try to go through them rapid fire style. Number one, the reuniting of the Fellowship. In the book, this happens in Athelion. The movie moved it to Minas Tirith to merge it with number two, the crowning of Aragorn and him marrying Arwen. The movie even skips the wedding entirely. Number three, the hobbits go home. The book has them traveling through Rivendell where they stay with Bilbo for a couple of weeks and then back again through Bree before reaching the Shire. 
The movie skips all that and have them arrive in the Shire immediately. Number four, the scouring of the Shire is removed in the movie. This is where the book death of Saruman happens as he has taken over the Shire and moved into Frodo's house. Number five, Sam marries Rosie Cotton. The book goes through Sam's connection with the Cotton family a, a lot more thoroughly and we get a sense that he and Rosie were sweethearts before he left on the ring quest. He and Rosie move in with Frodo at Bag End and start having babies, but the movie skips forward to number six, <laughs> uh, The Grey Havens. Book Frodo and Sam meet up with Bilbo and we learn that he and Bilbo will leave on the lost ship to sail for the Undying Lands. It is the same in the movie, but they have Merry and Pippin there from the start uh, instead of them arriving later, as it quite frankly makes more sense for Frodo to have invited them. And number seven, Sam returns home. He is now in possession of Frodo's house and says, I am back, as the last line of both book and movie. The end. <sighs> that was intense. <laughs> in general, everything in the movies is a lot more fast-paced than in the books. The split between POVs is also a lot more mixed, as it wouldn't have made sense for the timeline to only show Frodo and Sam at the last hour of every movie. It would be a bit of a pacing nightmare, probably. But this was a really fun exercise. Finally reading the books and comparing them to the movies. I want to know what you all think about them. Have you read the books or only seen the movies? If it's both, which one do you prefer? Leave all of your thoughts in the comments below. Also, don't forget to leave me a like and subscribe if you have not already done so. Thank you so much for watching today and I hope to see you back next time.